So right when I was fresh out of college, I managed to land myself a job with an engineering firm over in Pennsylvania. It kind of sucked having to move away from Rochester, New York, where all my friends and family were, but the salary this firm was offering was so sweet that I just couldn't turn it down. So I went online and got looking for apartments just outside of Philly, eventually finding an advert for a guy who was looking for a roommate for a super swanky apartment. I mean, this place was really nice, and I could get why the guy would be looking for a roommate to split the rent with, especially since he seemed to be a younger dude who was probably in a similar position as I was. However, I didn't have the time to drive down to actually look at the place or meet the guy in person, so I pretty much did all the arrangements by phone, which maybe, now that I look back on it, was my first big mistake. So I move in with this guy, Daryl, who was super chill and pretty much spent all day playing 2K since he worked nights. I figured that he must have had a pretty high paying job and since he had this huge flat screen TV, lots of expensive clothes, a nice car, the works really. We didn't talk all that much since we were on such different schedules but eventually when I asked him exactly what it is that he did for a living, he gave some super vague answer about having some kind of accountancy job. And no matter how much I pressed him for details, he always gave some wishy-washy answer until he got tired of the questions and changed the subject. Like a lot of you reading this, I started to suspect that Daryl wasn't quite telling the truth about what he did for a living. Like not once did I see him wearing anything like a shirt and tie. All his clothes were super upmarket, sure, but they were all super casual. He also had a lot of visitors in the evenings before we left for work. At first, I figured they were just friends of his, but there were a handful he didn't seem all that close with, and every time they stopped by to see him, at some point they'd just scuffle off into Daryl's bedroom for a while, talking in hushed tones before the visitor eventually left. I knew something was going on, but as embarrassing as it is, back then I was pretty naive. Besides that, I really didn't think it was any of my business. The last thing I wanted to do was upset my new roommate and screw away such a sweet living arrangement. So, this one Saturday, I'm in the local 7-Eleven just like a block away from the apartment when this dude comes up to me as I'm looking at coffee and asks me if I'm the guy who lives with Daryl. Obviously, I'm all like, yeah, good to see you, dude. I didn't recognize the guy, but I figured that he'd visit the apartment one time and I just couldn't quite remember his face. He's being all friendly and whatnot, making small talk about this and that before he asked if I know whether or not Daryl was at home right then. I told him I didn't know, but that since it was like mid-afternoon that he probably was since he worked nights, whatever that entailed. The guy's all like, okay, cool, I might stop by and say hi. And all this stuff then makes some excuses and leaves the store. I pick up a few things and head back to the apartment half expecting to see the guy from the 7-Eleven when I walk through the door. Only he's not there and when I tell Daryl about how I saw one of his buddies in the store, he has no idea who I'm talking about. Even when I describe the guy in quite vivid detail, he has absolutely zero clue who I'm referring to. He starts reeling off names asking if it was Deshaun or Robbie or Angelo and it's then that I sort of realize that the guy haven't given me a name at all. Which is weird, right? I mean, I thought it was. you think the dude would have been like, tell him such and such said hi, or at least something like that. I didn't really think anything of it at the time, but Daryl seemed just a little too freaked out by the encounter for my liking. And in the moments after I told him, he marches off into his bedroom and stays there for the rest of the evening, talking to someone, I'm guessing on the phone, in those same hushed tones that I was used to hearing. A few days after this, I'm walking back up towards the 7-Eleven to grab some milk for coffee when I see the same dude that hadn't given his name parked up at the side of the road. He calls out to me, greeting me and making chit-chat in that same warm way he had before, before again asking if Daryl was home. This time I straight up lie to him, telling him that yeah, Daryl was home, only this time he was with a bunch of his friends playing 2K. He wasn't. He was actually out visiting family across the city, but there was something about this guy that I really, really didn't like. I quickly make an excuse telling him I had to go and it was only then that this guy's demeanor started to change. He wasn't all smiles and laughs anymore. He just eyeballed me as I walked away and he was still there when I walked back, 
just watching me as I walked towards our apartment. I should have seen it coming, and I feel like such an idiot for not knowing what I was headed for, but I guess in hindsight it's always 2020. Because a couple of nights later I was just about to catch some sleep when Daryl finally comes home from work. He seems a little shaken and asks me if anyone had called by the apartment that evening. I tell him no, it's been pretty quiet, but the answer doesn't satisfy him. He asks me if I've seen anyone at all, anyone hanging around the area that I didn't recognize. I'd already told him about the second encounter that I'd had with the 7-Eleven guy, and this time it had creeped him out even more. He asked if I'd seen that same guy at any point that evening, and I told him no, that I hadn't seen him since that weekday evening. I turned the whole thing around and asked him why he was so nervous about this if anything had happened at work that evening, but he was his usual cagey self. He just retreated to his bedroom where he apparently went straight to sleep, which is exactly what I did too. Next thing I know, I'm waking up to this loud banging on the front door to our apartment. I had pretty much knew exactly what the deal was. Darrow had gone out to make a call, as he sometimes did at this time of night, and had left his keys in the apartment. This had happened a handful of times before and I was honestly getting really sick of being woken up by it. I suggested he actually put his car keys and apartment keys on the same key ring but nope, apparently that meant if he lost one set, he lost both. Which maybe was quite a smart idea in the long run but that's beside the point. So I'm all bleary eyed, shuffling toward the front door in my underwear and a t-shirt when he starts banging again. I'm like... All right, all right, I'm coming. Stop with the banging, Jesus. Before I undo the deadbolts and open the door, I start saying something like, You really should just attach those freaking keys. When I see it's not Darrow at all. In fact, I have no idea who the guy at the door is, because he's wearing a freaking ski mask, and I have absolutely not the time or will to ask him, nor the other two idiots that he's with. Because as soon as I open the door... He points a gun in my face and then frog marches me back inside the apartment before locking the door behind them. The ski mask guy makes me kneel on the floor in the TV room and whispers to me that if I shout or anything he's going to blow my brains out. I was absolutely terrified. I mean more scared than I've ever been in my entire life. I had these uncontrollable shakes like I had trouble just holding my head up. It was more comfortable for me to just rest my chin against my chest and pray that it'd all be over soon. This had a dual purpose too because the last thing I saw before I did so and shut my eyes tight was one of the guys placing an empty plastic bottle of the muzzle on his pistol. Naive over something I was, yes, but I knew enough to know that this was some kind of ad hoc way to silence a shot. I didn't want to see what happened next and I'm glad I didn't because they burst into Daryl's room, and I heard the pop of that pistol as they shot him. I thought he was dead for a few minutes, like I was convinced that they just straight up executed him right there in his bed. And that was until they dragged him out of the bedroom, bleeding and cursing, and threw him down on the TV room floor a few meters away from me. The one guy kept his gun to the back of my head while they pretty much tortured Daryl right there in the TV room. One guy stamped on the bullet wound that he had, leaning on it with a sneaker while the other forced his face into a couch cushion to muffle the screams. I mean, it was all obviously horrible what they were doing, and that was disturbing enough, but what really got me was how they seemed to enjoy the whole thing, how they seemed to take an immense amount of personal pleasure in causing us both as much pain and distress as was physically possible. It was like hearing Darrow's cries of pain was the funniest joke they'd ever heard, how the sight of his blood was the most fascinating, satisfying thing they'd ever seen. And it was then that it all came out. Like I said, you might have guessed what the deal was by now, but I pretty much had no idea back then. I was just so young and dumb. Daryl was a drug dealer and this was a robbery. So they beat the life out of him until he finally spoke up and told them where he kept his money in his stash. But I mean, for a while there, I thought they might have gotten the wrong place. Daryl flat out denied knowing what they were talking about and insisted that they got in the wrong place and how there was nothing to find there. But in the end, he broke and told them. They then took to clearing him out and from what he told me after he'd been discharged from the hospital for a fairly superficial gunshot wound to the shoulder, 
they'd taken him for about $20,000 plus. I had to cover Daryl's rent for a few months until he was well enough to get himself a real job. Turns out he was an actual college graduate with a business degree and was dealing in college to make a little money. When he graduated, the money came too easy that he just didn't bother to get a legit job. He wasn't a gangster. He just didn't have that kind of personality, which I suppose it would made him the perfect prey for the actual criminals that broke in that night. We got over what happened, but obviously Daryl still has this big old scar on his shoulder, a reminder of one of the worst nights of our lives, one that'll always be with us no matter where we go or what we do or who we become. My family is a small farm here in Kirkwood, upstate New York. We grow a few veggies, keep a few chickens, nothing too spectacular, but it's home and we love it. But a little while ago, back in early 2019, we got woken up by something in the middle of the night that scared the absolute life out of us. We have this big front yard with flower beds and a big lawn, and that's where we keep the chickens and the dog too. So me, my mom, and my dad were all sleeping one night when we're woken up by this huge crash in the front yard. I can hear our dog barking really, really loud and violently before there's like this yelping sound from it and he goes quiet. I walk out into the hallway and see my dad storming out of my parents' bedroom, rushing down the stairs to get his shotgun. Me and my mom were about to follow him outside to get a look at whatever was going on, but he yells at us to call the cops, stay inside, and not follow him under any circumstances. My dad grabs the phone and I rush back into my bedroom to watch from the window. As soon as I look out, I see this car that smashed through the fence of our yard and torn up a section of our lawn. It's obviously really dark out and the car's headlights are only lighting up a section of our yard, so I can't really see much outside of the beams. But I do see something that absolutely breaks my heart. It's our dog, lying on the front lawn, not moving at all. He looked really hurt. Something had really, really messed him up. But given that he was barking after the actual smash of the car, it couldn't have been the impact that hurt him so bad. Something else entirely. What I saw next was only because my dad had this little light attached to the end of his shotgun. He starts shining it around the front yard as I hear my mom calling 911 in the hallway, telling them that something horrible had happened at our address and for them to come as quickly as they could. Then my dad shines the shotgun light over towards the chicken coop and... I saw something that I continued to see in my nightmares for a long time to come. It was a man, completely naked from head to toe, kneeling among torn out feathers and broken bodies and he was sinking his teeth into the flesh of a still living chicken that he held tight in his grip. Every time he bit into the chicken it would flap and shake, making the most awful screeching noises as he tore more raw flesh from its body. My dad racked a shell into the chamber and started screaming at the guy to get out of the chicken coop. But the guy barely listens at first, just carries on ripping this big brown chicken apart with his bare hands and teeth. And by the time he does actually start listening to my dad, God, it was horrible. He looked right into the light of the shotgun so that his face was perfectly lit up and he smiled. There was blood and feathers all over his face and chin. He looked monstrous, totally insane eyes bulging out of their sockets. I think even to this day it's probably the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen. I started banging on the window and begging my dad to come back inside. I was so scared the guy was going to attack him or something and if he did, the dad would shoot him. And I know it's maybe a little lame of me but I just didn't want to see any of that. I was already distraught from seeing our dog just lying there all lifeless on the lawn and I know I wouldn't be able to handle it if anything had happened to my dad. Luckily, the guy didn't bother doing anything to my dad at first. I think he was just so blinded by the light of the shotgun that he just sort of stared into the flashlight, hypnotized by it for a few seconds. But he soon rose up off of his knees, that bloody, twitching chicken still in his grip, and started to make a move towards my dad. As soon as he did, the sound of dad's shotgun rang out as he fired a shot above the guy's head. But the guy hardly flinched. That's when I realized he must have been on some kind of drug or something, 
maybe meth or PCP or whatever. He didn't seem scared at all by the fact that he'd almost had his head blown off, but it was definitely enough to put him off from straight up attacking my dad. He just carried on smiling though, kneeling back down among the chickens as he carried on ripping them apart. It felt like an hour before I finally saw the red and blue flashing lights of the cop cars coming down the road, but from what I learned later it was only a couple of minutes before they actually arrived since they happened to have a unit in the area already down highway patrol. When they arrested the guy, he got really, really crazy, and they had to actually use their tasers, which had little effect at first, and pepper spray on the guy just to get him on the ground. We later found out that the guy, named John Many, was actually from Florida, that there had been a manhunt for him, and he'd somehow gotten all the way up to New York State using stolen cars and hiding himself away in trucks. We weren't the only place he'd attacked either, since he actually killed another dog on a different farm, maybe less than two miles away from us. That was definitely the most terrifying thing I'd ever woken up to in the middle of the night, by a long shot too. Thankfully, our dog survived. I live in a town of about 11,000 in rural Wisconsin, not by preference, but for a job. We are moving when I get a better one. I was on my way to my employer's house. He runs the company out of his basement until we get new office space. I was being tailgated bad by a ratty blue car and a white bald guy. I drive a Kia Soul, which has a flat back end, so if I can't see your headlights, you are a mere few inches off my butt, and you will get me tapping my brakes. This guy did. He honked at me. Whatever. I flipped him off and slowed down to five miles under the speed limit. There wasn't anyone behind him, so I wasn't ruining anyone else's day. He had chances to pass me on the county road, but didn't. After a few minutes with no other cars around and him still kissing my bumper at 50 miles per hour, I grabbed my cell phone and pretended to turn around quickly and take a picture of him. Then I pretended to call 911. I was in the country with no other cars around, and this guy was getting creepy. I came to my turn, but decided to see if this guy would follow me. I turned left, and he followed. Then I came to a roundabout and thought I would lose him. I traveled the entire thing around twice. He followed me. At this point I knew he was messing with me, trying to scare me. Well, I decided to let myself be late for my meeting. I began to drive to the police station. He followed me the whole way there. I pulled up and parked, ready to run inside. I thought he would leave. Nope. He parked right next to me and just stared at me and he pulled up on my side of the car, close enough that I would have had a hard time opening the door all the way. He was in his forties, I'm guessing, wearing sunglasses and a creepy smile. He was wearing fairly neat clothes, nothing scary there. The interior of the car was pristine, I was looking for a gun. I should mention here that I'm training to be a behavior analyst, and while I work with kids right now, my hobby is criminal behavior and profiling. I was seriously trying to read this guy. A few seconds went by and I grabbed my phone again, this time intent on calling 911 from the police station parking lot. As I dialed, he rolled his passenger window down, said nothing, rolled it back up, and took off. I went inside and told an officer what happened. Sadly, I was too focused on not crashing to get a plate. Apparently, there have been a lot of complaints about tailgaters recently, multiple with a blue car. I filled out a report with the officer and they gave me a card for victim services and a local women's shelter, just in case he followed me home one night and I didn't feel safe, but I live in a secure building with my fiancé. I went out to my car, and there was a note on the windshield. All it had on it was a smiley face, serious horror movie stuff. I took it back inside. The officer said he'd call me a few times during the night and I should avoid going anywhere alone for a while. He did call twice and said he was patrolling my parking lot during his night shift, this is a small town, and the attitude around here is very communal, so I feel safe in that someone will back me up. If I ever see this guy again, no question, I will call the cops and lead him straight to the police station again. I also told my fiancé that I will post my work schedule, or even when I have to leave for another reason, and that if I don't text him within 10 minutes of my estimated arrival time, he should call the police.
my hometown was decimated by flooding from Hurricane Floyd in 1999. Part of the response and recovery efforts involved FEMA setting up RVs as temporary housing for those whose homes were either destroyed or heavily damaged. These RVs were set up in a previously vacant field outside of town. The park was dismantled by 2001 or so. They put up fencing around the perimeter and trenched over the other streets into the area to keep people out. But they forgot one entrance or left it purposely open for emergency vehicles to have access. Some friends of mine had found this entrance, and we frequently used the area as our playground. We would go back there to set off fireworks, turn the streets into a race course, and to have sex with our girlfriends. To set the stage of how this place looked, there were three streets running east-west orientation, a street that went around the other streets in an oval fashion. The grass was very overgrown and about four feet high. The south and north sides of the area were wooded, and the east side had large dirt berms that were about 20 feet high and had been placed there when the site was graded in 1999. They normally provided a climbing challenge for our SUVs. On this particular day, my girlfriend and I were parked on one of the east-west streets amongst the tall grass to remain hidden. We got undressed to have sex in the back seat of the car. As we began, I noticed movement in the corner of my eye. I turned to look, and there was a man coming over the 20-foot-high dirt berm. He was wearing denim overalls, and in his left hand was a full-size axe. A wave of fear washed over me and I yelled out, Oh my God! My girlfriend popped up to look out the back windshield and let out a scream, asking, What are we going to do? Frantically, I started looking for the car keys. There was a pile of clothes on the floorboard and I couldn't find them. I looked out the back and he was getting closer. I could see his face now, emotionless with a blank stare. I started grabbing clothes and shaking them, hoping to find the keys. They popped loose and fell to the floor. I grabbed them and immediately jumped into the driver's seat, still completely naked. I started the car, and from the back seat my still naked girlfriend screamed, Go! I looked in the rearview mirror as I put the car into drive, and he was now within about 50 feet of the car, the same blank look on his face, but he was staring at the car with the axe still in hand. I didn't even fasten my seatbelt, and was still fully nude as I floored the gas, kicking up rocks everywhere as the tires spun while I sped away from this man holding the axe. We got out of the abandoned FEMA park as quickly as I could drive the car without crashing. My girlfriend was hysterical the whole time until we got back to the main road and were safe. We stopped about a mile up the road on the side of the road to put our clothes back on and de-stress. I don't know where this man came from, as there are no houses within a mile or so of the old FEMA site. He seemingly came out of nowhere. I also did not see any other cars at the site as I had done a lap around the park before we chose our spot to park. I'm not sure what his intentions were, as he never said anything to us, and I know he saw us panicking in the car. Whatever his intentions were, I know they weren't good. The look on his face and the axe in his hand made that abundantly clear. I went back with a few friends a few days later and found no place this guy could have been lurking, and there were no signs anyone had been camping there. To this day, it's one of the scariest events I've ever been through. Deep in the middle of nowhere America in the early hours of March 3rd, 1980, a girl is born. She was the apple of her parents' eyes. From that day on, she could do no wrong. Every birthday was a celebration of her greatness. As she grew into womanhood, she stumbled not once. Her beliefs were always in line with modern thinking and her opinions were never the wrong ones. If you were to ask them, her folks would put her on par with the angels as near as to divine and beautiful as humanly possible. This is all BS, of course. The girl was never honest with her elders, not fair to her peers. In school, her grades were average at best. Her awkward fumblings with boys were well known. No one around her age respected or liked her. There were a few she controlled through fear, but in time, even they would break away. The child was nothing like the divine creature her parents viewed her to be. You ask, how do you know all this? Well, you see, I was foolish enough to marry her. I'll refer to her as Alicia from here on. Alicia and I had known one another since middle school. We'd grown up not far apart. Her beauty was a truly breathtaking thing to behold, but it was her only redeeming value. For some strange reason, I was the guy she chose. Over time, I'd come to discover why. Her upbringing had made her an abusive narcissist. 
This was a major turnoff for most guys on her level. I guess guys on my level were more susceptible to her feminine powers. She knew she had me on the hook from the beginning, but not once did she abuse me the way she did everyone else. I'm not sure I would have broken it off if she had. The relationship had its ups and downs like most do. Every few months we'd get into an argument and break up, only be back together soon after. Anytime society robbed her of something, which was often, I was the one there to prop her up. Maybe at the time I actually believed the world was out to get her. She certainly did. Through every bit of drama I never considered life without her in it. That's certainly why I followed her to community college despite being accepted to Stanford. I honestly thought that we'd be moving there after two years anyway. Per usual, she barely survived those two years. The grades were terrible, and she had to appeal after flunking out of her first semester. I would do all her homework after that and drill her relentlessly until she passed. She was never really stupid. She'd just been raised to believe everything was hers by right. At the end of that time period, she took a terrible job for her friend's interior design company. When I brought up moving to California, she claimed her job was too important to give up. After a lot of inner conflict, I gave up my dream of Stanford and found a nearby university to attend. Four years would fly by. I continued on with school while she bounced from one dead-end job to the other. Our first daughter was born along this time. Alicia took a long time to bounce back mentally, but when our second daughter arrived three years later, she seemed fine. By then, I was teaching at the high school. A last-minute death in the staff meant I was filling in as a wrestling coach, too. This meant I was spending less time at home. Alicia had long since quit working to raise the girls, a situation I had no problem with. Unfortunately, this gave her time to brood. She began accusing me of having an affair. The saddest aspect of all this was the fact that I still loved her just as much as the day we met. I never once thought of other women. The accusations broke my heart. The claims of cheating had been going on for almost six months. Strangely, one day they all stopped. Two days passed until I had a free day to spend with her and the girls. Everything was great all throughout the day. She even cooked me a wonderful dinner. Afterwards, I was so exhausted I let her know that I was turning in early. I expected this would make her mad, but she looked angry. I should have known things weren't right when she tucked me in. She'd never been the type to do that, not even for the kids. It didn't set off any alarms at the time, though, and soon I was sound asleep. At some point, I was awakened by a sharp pain in my chest. I fought to wake up. I also noticed a pounding sensation. I finally got my eyes open and I saw a form on my chest banging on it repeatedly. I was in that state where I wasn't sure if I was dreaming. Waking up was strangely difficult, but I eventually managed to do it. With my eyes wide open now, I could tell that form was Alicia. I couldn't understand what she was doing, but I knew it hurt. I summed up all the power I could and pushed her off. I ran my hand across my chest and felt a wetness. It took a second to realize that she had been stabbing me. That was when I began to panic. She was already attempting to mount me again, but I fought her off. I knew I had to get away. My legs felt like I was running through the mud, and I didn't know why. I didn't make it to the door before she jumped on my back and renewed her attack. My survival instincts had kicked in now, and... I slung her to the floor, but she sprung back at me. I impulsively struck her twice across the chin, which knocked her out cold. I'm still amazed at what I did. It was something I know I couldn't have done in any other circumstance. This gave me a chance to get a phone and call for help. Our oldest had been awakened by all the noise. She noticed the blood all over me and began to cry. I covered it up by saying I'd spilled ketchup on myself, and I'm not sure she bought it, but... She did go back to bed when I asked her to. By now, I could hear Alicia trying to escape from the bedroom. I was in no condition to stop her. I now know she had drugged me. I ran into the hall bathroom and locked myself in. Only now did the blood loss begin to affect me. The dispatcher did her best to keep me awake, bless her heart, but within a few minutes, everything went black. When I regained consciousness the following day, the pain was agonizing. 
My yelling alerted a nurse who came in and adjusted my IV. Not much happened for a few days. I remember short spurts of consciousness, but not much more. On the fourth day, I awoke on my own, still uncomfortable but feeling better. A nurse arrived and let me know which buttons did what. She left and returned a little while later with breakfast. It was the first time in my life I'd ever had grits. I was so hungry I devoured everything. After lunch is when the cops showed up. I certainly wasn't expecting what I'd heard. It turned out that Alicia tried to rush the responding officers with a knife and they shot her. She had survived and was recuperating just down the hall. And on a positive note, my girls were staying with my mom. I thank her to this day for having the presence of mind not to bring them to me. This all happened in 2008 and I wasn't able to fully explain the entire mess to them for a few years. For the sake of brevity, I was released later that week and Alicia was transferred to the county jail a few days later. She soon took a plea and agreed to 15 years. With all that resolved, I tried to focus on my daughters. I've been fortunate enough to have two supportive parents who've helped me out a lot. Sacrificing my teaching job was something of a disappointment, but administration gave me a regular 9 to 5 arrangement. My oldest is nearing graduation and her sister isn't far behind. I'm amazed at how well they've handled everything, especially growing up into womanhood without a mother. Alicia reached out to them once or twice, but they refused the invitation. I'm never bad to talk to her around them, even after what she did. The choice had always been left up to them. At the end of the day, I think Alicia is the one who suffered the most from all of this. Listen, I'm not making her a victim. She was 100% responsible for her actions, but I know for a fact being away from her daughters was torture. The wounds she received never fully healed. The few times I did speak to her, she made mention of her constant pain. Then, just as she was nearing the end of her sentence, she contracted COVID and passed away. It definitely wasn't an ending anyone deserves. Not even her. <laughs>